This night we ride the storm. This night we smite the savage and the demon. This night we fling open gates long closed. The fallen will be avenged a hundredfold, and the dark gods will feel our fury. This night, brothers, we bring war. The Age of Sigmar Just as reality seemed about to splinter apart, a new sun dawned, a new day, cast in the light of the blazing tempest, burned itself into the annals of fate. With that explosive strike against the darkness, the war for the mortal realms was never again the same. The blood-sodden centuries since the God King's retreat were not spent idly. Every day and night was put to a singular purpose, revenge. The reclamation of that which had been lost was foremost in Sigmar's mind. With help from his divine allies, he put into motion a plan to remake history. Long had the tempest of the God King's wrath gathered. So intense was that emotion, it had become a dark thunderhead in Azir, a storm of spiritual energy that had the power to smash the dark nations of chaos, if only it were given form. And form it would have, though at a cost that was all but immeasurable. In time, Not only would Sigmar's simmering anger manifest as an arcane force, but a breed of living weapon more potent than any that had come before. At length, Sigmar had brooded while staring deep into the roiling core of malice. He knew from bitter experience He could not win the war against chaos whilst fighting as he had in his former lives. Not even a god could shatter the stranglehold of chaos. And certainly not one that had lost the weapon so symbolic of his potency. So it was Sigmar became not a champion of humanity not a child of war, but its terrible father. The God King would fight with fists and hammer no longer. His weapon of choice would be not an artifact, but a new civilization, the celestial hosts of Azir. At the forefront would be an army like no other, one that could fight a thousand battles at one time. In High Azir, from his palace of Sigmaron, the God King looked down upon those he had forsaken with a heavy heart. Each city and nation falling before the scourge of chaos was a new wound in his soul. Yet, Within the last desperate battles of each people, he found seeds of true heroism. From the threshold of disaster, he snatched those heroic few who fought against chaos until their dying breath, lifting them up into the realms of heaven in a blaze of lightning. With the aid of Grungni, the Great Maker, who still considered his debt to Sigmar unpaid, a new race of superhumans was created from these valorous souls. Together, 
they crafted an army of miracles, a host of armored angels forged from the souls of the finest men and women still fighting in the mortal realms. Sigmar named them the Stormcast Eternals, warrior paladins who had lightning in their blood and who would be reborn in a blaze of energy even should they die in the long war against chaos. In time, they were to do just that, returning to Azir in a blast of lightning with each death there to be reforged and sent back into battle time and time again, until their eternal nature saw their very identities slowly erode. The breaking of Sigmar's Tempest knew no such tribulations, for it was a time of unalloyed hope. After a full night of war song and final preparations, where the air was electrified with the promise of retribution to come, the long wait was over, and the Stormcast Eternals were unleashed. The first columns of lightning shot from Sigmaron down to blast into the blood-stained earth of the mortal realms. Born upon them were the first brotherhoods of the Stormcast Eternals. They smashed into the ravaged lands of chaos as columns of bright heavenly energy, each dome of lightning dissipating to reveal towering, broad-shouldered warriors, armed and armored with the magical metal Sigmarite the very stuff of the world that was that Sigmar had once called his home. Heavy broad blades and energy wreathed hammers smashed into horned helms, rune carved breastplates, and shields covered in human skin. For the first time in living memory, the hordes of chaos knew fear. This new force in the cosmos struck the servants of chaos like a spear of lightning cast by an angry god. Sigmar's vengeance against the chaos gods had been slow in coming, but when it had finally arrived, it had done so with epic shattering fury. Formerly convinced of their own supremacy, they were sent reeling in disarray. Within a matter of hours, a hundred beachheads were formed across the lands, each an island of golden glowing potential amidst a sea of darkness and despair. They were mere pinpricks of hope, and many were to be subsumed as the followers of chaos rallied and took the fight to the newcomers with a great roar of bloodlust. But many others became the first kernels of a new civilization that was to span the realms and give hope to the tattered remnants of humanity that they may fight back and maybe with the might of the gods behind them emerge victorious. The Realm Gate Wars. Sigmar's first priority was to break the stranglehold that the Chaos Gods had on the seven realms outside Azir. He would do so not through decapitation of the enemy's forces, nor through a war of attrition, but by claiming and fortifying the arcane portals known as Realm Gates. The mortal realms are vast, so much so that to a normal man 
they may as well be infinite. They are also ravaged, and in many places barren or poisonous in some manner. The notion of simply marching armies from one nation to the next is laughable, especially given the distances they would have to traverse, and the lethality of the wilderness so thoroughly polluted by the chaos gods. Over the course of the Age of Chaos, Grungni had labored as only a creator god can. He had given the kingly gift of arcane lightning to Sigmar as part of their great work, allowing the god king to hurl his storm hosts into the fray straight from the heavens. They struck wherever he judged their attacks best placed, but once earthbound, they could only return to Azir through discorporation upon death. Because of this, and the dizzying scale upon which Sigmar was opening his war fronts, the Stormcast Eternals were tasked with seizing those realm gates that still remained relatively intact. The suddenness of their assault was a weapon in itself, and they seized hundreds of critical locations before the forces of chaos could properly muster a counterattack. Defended by Lord Castellans and fortified by their Dwarden allies, each was soon the heart of a keep, then a castle, then a township. Those same realm gates form the kernels of the cities of Sigmar to this day, allowing travel across immense distances within the realm, or even in the case of the most powerful, from one realm to another. The secondary mission of the storm hosts was one of alliance. They were given the task of hunting out the estranged members of Sigmar's pantheon and bringing them together in a new war effort against their mutual nemesis. In Giran, the Hollowed Knights fought through impossible adversity, calamity, and despair, before finally winning Alariel to their side. Roused as she was from their despondent seclusion, to fight back against Nurgle once more. The anvils of the Heldenhammer, sent to deal with Nagash, found far less in the way of success. Still, as word spread of a new force in the cosmos, the first sparks of hope became a wildfire of defiance. Those ragged survivors of the Age of Chaos made haste to the new cities and were welcomed with open arms. The critical conquests of that time occurred at the interstitial sub-realm known as the Eight Points, which led to every realm in turn. Though once the sole province of Archaon, by the end of the Realm Gate Wars, Three of its eight archways were wrenched from the claws of Chaos, allowing Sigmar to consolidate his holdings in Akshi, Giran, and Gur. Seeds of Hope Hundreds of realm gates, taken at great cost in lives, formed the hubs of new strongholds. Around them, the wheels of civilization began to turn anew. First of the founding cities were the Seeds of Hope in Guran, though every mortal realm boasts cities of its own. Though most are under siege, and a few are thriving despite the odds. 
Over the course of this new and tumultuous season of war, the foundations were laid for Sigmar's new order. The God King and his Stormcast advisors had chosen wisely when it came to sites of power that would form the cornerstones of his empire to be. Each placed on a nexus of the invisible lines of magic that crossed the realms and linked them in geomantic web. Most of the new cities were built in an impressively short space of time. Their construction powered by the near limitless energy of the magical yet volatile substances referred to as Realmstone. Yet, even Sigmar had not foreseen the speed with which those under Lariel's aegis would blossom. First amongst the Seeds of Hope was the Living City, a metropolis of oak and stone in the verdant bosom of Theria, the westernmost nation of the Everspring Swath. The Living City grew not from artifice, but from magic. By working a great rite of root, bark, and tendril, L'Oreal shaped the city from the forest, the land, and the rivers that flowed through them. It is said that the city grew in a matter of days. And whereas the other nascent metropolises of that time resounded to the sound of hammer upon chisel, the living city was shaped only by the spirit song of the Sylvaneth and the groan of twisting, sprouting trees. Though blighted by Nurgle when the Plague Father's power waxes high, it has formed an excellent bulwark against the darkness and is the core of a long-standing alliance between the men, elves, and Sylvaneth of that region. Around the same time, the Phoenicium was founded in nearby Quagmia. The city's predecessor was long ago consumed by a colossal avalanche of fluid amber. The sap volcanoes of Erosia had filled the lands with translucent tree blood, and the arboreal Quagmia mountain heaved so mightily that it split its sides. The ancient city that had once dwelt upon its shoulders, Elf Grove, was entrapped completely in the rapidly solidifying resin. Only with the founding of the Seeds of Hope did Alariel and her Phoenix Temple allies unite to melt the amber from the mountain's flanks and give life to the ancient city once more, renaming it the Phoenicium. Ever since, the city has been synonymous with rebirth and with vengeance against the forces of chaos. Stark, by contrast, is the city of Greywater Fastness. This industrial metropolis, a blot on the landscape of once beautiful Verdia, is known for its artillery, its black powder, and its commitment to bringing technological wonders to the other nations of Giran. Of all the seeds of hope, Greywater used Realmstone the most recklessly and the polluting byproduct of its machines has forever fouled the lands all about the city. So much so that they've been renamed the Ghoul Mare. This was such an affront to the Sylvaneth of the region that the city was almost wiped out 
by an enraged nature spirits until an agreement was struck. The city was effectively quarantined, with only one way in or out. Should its industry expand its borders ever again into the mist-shrouded wastes, Lariel will let the vengeful tree spirit Pale Oak and his dreadwood kin tear it all down until nothing remains. Close to follow these new cities was Hammerhall Gira, the half of the twin-tailed city built around the Storm Rift Realm Gate in Verdia. Together with its counterpart in Akshi, Hammerhall Aksha, it forms the largest metropolis in the mortal realms. The cities of the Everspring Swath and those of the Great Parch have established an impressive network of trade and military cooperation. Akshi boasts many cities to rival the Seeds of Hope. Though they may be decades younger, Vigilant Tempest's Eye, Gloom-shrouded Anvil Guard, Magic-obsessed Hallowheart, and Cosmopolitan Brightspear have all become famous strongholds in their own right. Over the hundred years or so since the Realmgate Wars, scores of Sigmarite cities have been established across the mortal realms. For every one that has built its walls tall and strong. However, there have been dozens that did not survive the intense battles of the Age of Sigmar. The ruins dot the lands in every nation. Their shattered walls and temples, a sad testament to the power of the evils that still claim the realms. Dark Omens Though the new cities raised their walls high, none were truly safe. An ancient enemy of Sigmar's had been slowly amassing power in the darkness of Shyish and was ready to make its move. Nagash's grand scheme neared fruition, and already the ripples of his impossibly ambitious masterwork were felt across the realms. It started slowly at first, much like the dark labors that had led to this point. No fanfare announced, the time of tribulations, merely a series of ever more disturbing omens and morbid portents that unsettled even those used to life in the mortal realms. Harvests were spoiled, with corn shucked to find no more than scatterings of teeth. Dead ravens fell from the skies to carpet the muddy roads. Laughing skull shapes were glimpsed in the clouds, and the scents of rotten carrion and dry, dusty tombs were borne upon the winds. Even more portents and signs unfolded, as if the realms themselves were attempting to warn of that which was to come. Ominous visions were experienced by seers, prophets, and even normal folk whose nights had been plagued by the dire hauntings. First amongst them, Vandis Hammerhand, Lord Celestant and hero of the Brimstone Peninsula. He brought a warning to the God King a warning that had been brought to him in turn by the humanoid figure of pure lightning that whispered to him in his dreams. A work of intense evil was almost complete 
in the depths of Nagash's realm. And should it reach fruition, all that Azir had strived for would be forfeit. Bandis was not alone in his foreboding. Each race and species had seers and doomsayers of their own, many of whom had successfully galvanized their people into marching upon Shaiish. As Sigmar's Lord Ordinators organized brotherhoods of Stormcast Eternals to lead the armies of the Free Cities, the hordes of destruction seethed from their lairs, driven by an innate desire for war more than any preset battle plan. Even the chaos-worshipping armies of the hinterlands and wastes sent war parties to the realm of death. Their chieftains were well used to heeding their soothsayers, and by this point all were sure that the amethyst realm was the provenance of the ghastly emanations. The source of the growing curse upon the realms was not merely a rise in deathly energy, but a specific directed agenda that Nagash had set in motion thousands of years ago. The Supreme Lord of the Undead had crossed all of Shaiish in his quest to become the sole deity of that realm. He had confronted the lesser death gods that had formerly ruled over the quietude of each paradise and purgatory, conquering them one by one, consuming their energy, and then expanding his empire so that it spread over every isle and landmass that formed the underworlds. Yet to Nagash, it was not enough. Still there were souls that slipped through his bony grasp. Still there were those that other gods, Sigmar amongst them, snatched from what he saw as his rightful dominion. That being commanded over all things that had passed from the mortal coil. From his slow-burning bitterness was born a plan of epic-ending scale. Nagash ordered his most trusted servant, the Lich Archon, to gather the realm stone from the perimeter inimical of his chosen realm. There, the grave sand native to Shaiish could be found in such abundance that the realm's edge was swathed with the purple-gray dunes, each grain tied intrinsically to the mortality of a living soul. No human agent could have withstood the concentration of deathly energies in that place for long. For there, life force can be blown away by the wind as if it were no more than spider silk. Instead, Archon put to work legion upon legion of the undead skeletons that obeyed his will. Guided by his black disciples, each of these bone warriors carried a single grain of the grave sand back to Nagash's ark trekking back and forth in single file like ants carrying particles of food to their nest. A mortal man in such close proximity to the crystallized energy of endings would have aged quickly and died in his labors. But the skeletons in Archon's service endured their burden without faltering. was an endeavor of insane scale and ambition, one that only an immortal could have hoped to enact. But 
in its silent, methodical slowness, it was one that remained all but unopposed for centuries. If a group of skeletons was battered apart by reavers, orcs, or arcane storms, another one would be sent in its place to retrieve that which was lost, and that part of the work begun over again until it was eventually completed. In the secret heart of Nagashazar, the realm stone was systematically gathered and vitrified through alchemical processes into a hard obsidian-like stone. From this, Nagash constructed a vast inverted pyramid. The culmination of that monumental work saw the Great Black Pyramid completed. Despite the best efforts of those who drove deep into the heart of Shyish in an attempt to stop it. Nurgle himself was offended by the sterility and finality of the deathly visions he saw swirling in his cauldron, and sent forth his favorite demons into the realm of death once more. Yet even the deluge of the noisome life conjured by Rodigus' rainfather could not break the great necromancer's hold over the prime inner lands. Even as the cities of Sigmar were being established across the mortal realms, forces faithful to the god king under the command of Lord Ordinator Voris Starstrike braved forgotten realm skates, cursed deserts, and yawning chasms converge upon Nagashazar, their assault coinciding with that of the savage chaos-worshipping war queen, Marakar Bloodsky. On the final approach to Nagash's stronghold, the two mighty armies were goaded into attacking one another instead by the manipulations of the Zinjian trickster demon known only as the changeling, and they fell into a grinding stalemate. It was the rampaging hordes of destruction that posed Nagash's work the greatest threat, for in their headlong belligerence they had smashed their way through the outer defenses of Nagash's R. Perhaps if all three forces had reached the city at the same time, history would have been very different. But as it was, the green-skinned hordes were cut down by the elite and unblinking guardians of the great necromancer's prized necropolis. Now the greatest concentration of magical force in all Shyish, the Great Black Pyramid, formed the focus of a rite long planned by Nagash. The Undying King himself magnified its arcane charge in a ritual so powerful that it saw the sky buckle and twist as the magical polarity of the entire realm was effectively inverted. Spinning like the tip of a drill, the pyramid plunged into the heart of the realm to create the Shyish Nadir, a colossal pit of concentrated deathly energy, so powerful that its creation sent shockwaves across the entire cosmos. The consequences of this grand ritual were to manifest in many ways, but foremost as a plague of undeath, a realm-spanning invasion of tortured souls from the underworlds into the lands of the living, and a permanent reshaping of the realm of death. 
No longer would Nagash have to labor endlessly to bring the dead of the realms under the control of their rightful sovereign. Instead, the underworlds of Shayish would come to him, like flotsam drawn to the heart of a whirlpool. The lands of the realm of death were slowly, irrevocably drawn towards the great necromancer's stronghold of Nagashazar. There, to be broken down into little more than black silt rich in eldritch energy. With that great metaphysical conquest, Nagash had cemented his power over the realm of death. The races of man, elf, dwarden, and greenskin alike reeled in confusion and despair. Even the dark gods bellowed in outrage, for the bedlam unleashed by Nagash's great work had tipped the balance of power massively in his favor. A new nightmare had befallen the war-torn mortal realms. The Soul Wars The mortal realms ravaged as they were by the scourge of chaos, were caught in the throes of a new cataclysm. Known as the Necroquake, it saw the spirits of the dead rise in their billions to fall screaming with jealous hatred upon the lands of the living. When the formation of the Shaiish Nadir remade the substance of the realm of death. Shock waves of necromantic force cascaded across the etheric void. They broke across each of the realms in turn, the skies rippling with strange lights and howling distorted skull forms as Nagash's scheme infected every nation and wilderness even that of Azir, which knew war for the first time in centuries. Shayish was once a realm where the spirits of the dead had known stability and sanctity. Being the realm of endings, it was accepted in every culture that upon death the soul would travel to whatever afterlife its living form had believed in before its demise. Be that paradise, purgatory, or simply another form of existence. Nagash did not look kindly on the provinces of other death gods, for he considered himself the final and ultimate deity of Shaiish, and worked to subsume them into his own domains. Great Necromancer was incensed by the existence of other gods of death, but he was driven into a cold rage by the temerity of other breeds of deity claiming dominion over departed souls. The Dark Gods had long claimed the souls of those who bore their respective marks. The elven gods, Tyrion, Teclis, Morathi, and Malarion, remade their kin in new forms, and Laurel, the Everqueen, was known to give her followers new life. Most hated of all was Sigmar, the soul thief who snatched those heroic souls upon the threshold of death and the long war against chaos, and remade them as stormcast eternals. Perhaps there was an argument that those about to lose their lives in his name had not yet passed the threshold of mortality. But the existence of the anvils of the Heldenhammer 
an entire storm host recruited from the souls of long dead warriors made it abundantly clear that the god king had only contempt for Nagash's rightful rule. This, more than any other factor, was the spark that caused the dangerously dry structure of their alliance to burst into a roaring, killing flame. The depths of Nagash's long, simmering ire only came to the fore when the necroquake cascaded across reality. The resultant onslaught was made by a new and deathly army that was truly without number. Nagash, who saw the departed souls of mortals as little more than a resource to be used for his own whims, had for centuries twisted those under his dominion into hideous mockeries of their former selves. Those hateful phantoms upon the coming of the necroquake found themselves suddenly connected to their mortal remains. Be they smoldering corpses or ancient skeletons petrified by the passage of time. Along the shimmering silver threads of these links, the souls traveled into their native realms, a little as if they were traversing one-man realm gates, to rise from their graves in the form of hideous geists. And so the processions of the night haunt came to the waking worlds. The geists were carried surging on the winds of the necroquake to a thousand towns and cities. They were driven by an unholy compulsion to tear down the living, an insane and unquenchable jealousy that they could only assuage by killing those warm-bodied vital people who still had the temerity to draw breath. At their head came the truly damned, those souls who had been remade by Nagash himself. The better to ensure their eternal punishment fit the crimes they had committed, knowingly or not, against his empire. Ghostly hangmen and ethereal executioners Grave creepers, healers turned slaughterers, dark cavaliers, even spectral coach and horses drifted or galloped through the air. Each a soul curdled to bitter hatefulness before being unleashed. Ultimate command of this new deathly host was given to Lady Ollander the newest and arguably the most terrifying of all of Nagash's Mortarks, for she could kill a man simply by lifting the wedding veil that covered her face. It was the free city of Glimsforge in the prime innerlands that first faced a night haunt invasion. Being a city of the realm of death, its people were well versed in the ways of repelling the undead. Nearly every household had a cat to hiss a warning should an unquiet spirit enter, and a sacred circle of magically treated purple salt that no ghost could cross was sewn around the city limits. The treason of a jilted, jealous soul saw that good work undone when one of the commanders of the city's defense joined Nagash's side out of spite. In doing so, becoming a knight of shrouds and leading the assault on the city 
he had once called home. Only the intervention of a new faction of Stormcast Eternals, the warrior mystics of the Sacrosanct Chambers, stopped the city from being overrun. The Arcanum Optimar Scant few generations after Sigmar's tempest broke, the cosmos was battered by a new period of strife. Known as the Arcanum Optimar, it bolstered the power of those who could wield magic to dangerous levels, and through them unleashed new and lethal spells upon the realms. Though few realized it outside of Nagash's macabre court, the creation of the Shyish Nadir had not gone entirely to plan. A strike force of Skaven from the clan's Ishan had unveiled itself into the outskirts of Nagash's Ark just as the main ritual was nearing completion. Most of them were slain by the unsleeping guardians of the city, but a handful of their finest agents made the leap from the tallest buildings to the underside of the Black Pyramid. And, with diamond-sharp climbing claws, crawled their way inside. In the pyramid's depths, they gouged out precious warp stone from intricately laid designs, and scratched out the Hekaran runes of power purely for the thrill of vandalism. They did not survive the magical backlash. It was a meager, petty slight but it was enough to throw the carefully engineered right off kilter at the last moment. When the Black Pyramid came alive with magic and began to spin faster and faster to burrow into Shyish, it did so with the cooling bodies of several agents of chaos within it. It was this crack in the otherwise perfect mosaic of cause and effect that saw the right of the necroquake billowing out of control, not only sending waves of ending magic across the realms, but also changing the nature of spellcasting itself. Perhaps the agents of Clan Shen succeeded where others failed because Nagash underestimated the Skaven, and not for the first time. It is said by the sacrosanct chambers of High Azir that all sentient undead, no matter how powerful, are cursed to make the same mistakes they made in their mortal lives. Perhaps there was another agent behind even the Skaven, it has been claimed amongst the echelons of the Varenspire that a Zinchian arch sorcerer had manipulated the Skaven Master Clan into sending forth their agents and thereby corrupting the Gash's great right. The Changeling, another servant of Zinch, was behind the artful misdirections that set the invasion forces of Sigmar's pantheon against those of their chaos nemesis on the final approach to Nagash's Ark. There are amongst the Caradon overlords who believe agents of Zinch were behind the industrialized use of Realmstone. For where the Eldritch material exists, Anarchy usually follows, and the dawn of the Arcanum Optimar has only made such instances worse. 
Certainly the architect of fate stands to benefit from an era of wild and unpredictable magic, especially when he is able to lay the blame at another's door, so that his brother gods do not suspect his hand and join their efforts in an attempt to thwart his newfound power. As the ramifications of this new age set in, there were many skilled in the magical arts that put their heightened abilities to good use. Many of the night haunt assailing the lands were banished by spells of impressive power. But there were always more to take their place. Desperate, sorcerers reached for ever more ambitious spells and incantations. These mages drew themselves into the anarchic power roiling across the cosmos, shaped it and hurled it back out, more deadly than ever before. The most powerful spells they cast manifested not for a mere moment, nor even an hour or a day, but indefinitely. With the right incantations, artifacts, and gestures, a wizard can draw motes of certain types of eldritch energy into a coalesced form. But those energies will soon be pulled apart once more by the irresistible draw of the realm's edge, where the most powerful magics gather. That immutable law of magic was broken with the coming of the Arcanum Optimar. Shorn of their due demise by the backlash of Shyishian energies, these spells had no natural end. They continued to assail the realms long after they were cast, becoming roving forces of destruction that often fed on their victims as a vampire feeds upon its prey. Some even turned upon their creators, whose initial thrill at having sent such a powerful eldritch force against the foe was replaced by stark terror as the conjuration turned against its caster. Eventually, these unnatural hazards were named for the particular dangers and avoided at all costs. After the disastrous living inferno of Hallowheart, the collegiate arcane sent covens of bright wizards to channel and dissipate rogue Akshian spells and cadres of Shyishian adepts to nullify the spells that hailed from the realm of death. Whenever a spell proved too powerful for the collegiate to banish, the elven mages that patronized the free cities would intervene, riding enchanted steeds and sinuous drakes to hunt down those spells that crackled beyond the reach of men. Yet for every endless manifestation dispelled, dismantled, or sent to the edges of the realm through sheer willpower, for every sorcerous energy placed in a solid physical form or banished by roving spell hunters, a dozen more raged on across the realms killing or eternally cursing those foolish enough to approach them. As the necroquake rippled out across the realms, it unmade many long-existing enchantments and protective rites, overloading them with the sheer force of Shyishian magic, or casting them aside as a gale breaks through a net of cobwebs. Amongst these magics 
were the memory shrouds that hid away the sights known as storm vaults. Whilst Sigmar roamed the lands during the Age of Myth, he had uncovered many glorious things, but also encountered artifacts, ancient relics, and entities too dangerous for mortal men to use. To ensure the safety of his people, he locked them away, and bound guardian forces and entities to each site so that ambitious or desperate men could not claim them. He did so not in High Azir, for there they could potentially wreak havoc in his home territory, but in the realms in which he had found them. So were created the Storm Vaults, God-made jails, and reliquary complexes that ranged in the size from chapels to small cities. When Teclis gave Sigmar the deific gifts known as the Enlightenment Engines, the God King saw opportunity. Though the elaborate gilded machines were intended to open the mine, to allow the human allies of the elves to achieve a state of higher learning and master the arts of magic, Sigmar turned them to a different purpose. By having them remade to use their power in reverse, he ensured that instead removed the memories and conscious thoughts of those nearby and installed them upon his storm vaults. For centuries, the mind-altering shroud they cast kept these arcane repositories hidden, even in plain sight. With the coming of the Necroquake, even these godly works were undone. Suddenly, the storm vaults were revealed. Magnificent edifices that had been completely concealed mere hours before. When word spread that they contained priceless artifacts, inquisitive lords, treasure hunters, and opportunists of every race and creed raced to seize their bounty. Most of those intrepid enough to raid the storm vaults were slain, but some found success and laid claim to riches beyond measure. So were set loose countless spells and artifacts that Sigmar had once gone to impossible lengths to conceal. Ascension of a Dark Queen Morathi, the Shadow Queen of Olgu, had long desired godhood. She had languished in power by comparison to her son, Malarion, but over time had risen to prominence as the oracle of a god who no longer spoke. Now, with the realms in upheaval, she was to make her greatest gamble. The events that led to Marathi's ascension were an interlocking labyrinth of schemes with many pitfalls, as well as dizzying peaks of ambition. Relegated to the most dangerous and undesirable part of Olgu by her bitter and resentful son, Marathi had rebuilt herself, making pacts with shadow demons and artfully co-opting the remnants of a dead religion. She became an iron-willed queen amongst those elves she was able to save from Slanesh's gullet. And though that blood cult started small, it was to grow to nation-spanning power. Morathi was so steeped 
the alchemy of blood and form, that she could offer eternal youth to her supplicants. A potent draw indeed for those who had been ravaged by war and strife. Morathi's Scathborn formed an elite of terrifying power, but the true master stroke was inveigling her cult into the cities of Sigmar by fighting tooth and nail against the chaos invaders wherever they were found. During the Realmsgate Wars, Morathi and Sigmar struck a lasting alliance over the corpses of this common foe. As the new cities rose on the bones of the old, her daughters were seen in every metropolis in some form or another. From troops of alluring blade dancers and gladiatrixes to secretive priesthoods devoted to the ancient elf god of murder, Cain. As it was to transpire, her influence slowly bled into the darkling covens of the cities, and even into the Ideneth enclaves that preyed upon the Sigmarite nations as a fisher preys upon the bounty of the sea. The Shadow Queen's ascension was to come at a price. She had learned well of the strange realmstone Veronite, that molten, gore-like substance that could transmute the physical form, and potentially the stuff of the soul as well. Amongst her cults, she had introduced the notion that this mutagenic liquid was the very blood of Cain himself, and that it had to be claimed from the Eight Points, that interstitial sub-realm under the sway of Archaon since the Age of Chaos. She sent forth her elite shadow-marked agents to the Varen Spire, where they found a vast industrialized mining operation designed to extract the molten ichor from the realmstone-rich area known as Varenthax's Maw. Morathi's pact with Sigmar was instrumental in the next step of her plan. Her agents had uncovered the fact that Archaon was using freshly mined Varenite to melt away the long-closed meteoric gates, the sealed arcway portal that had long barred his forces from invading the realms of heaven. Should he succeed, Morathi said, then all Azir would pay the price. Sigmar had little choice but to intervene, and before the Hishian sun set on their discussion, combined force of Stormcast Eternals and Daughters of Cain were en route to Varenthax's Maw to sabotage Archaon's ploy. The storm hosts attacked in great pomp and splendor, as Morathi had known they would. They formed a perfect distraction as she went after her true goal, the Varenite itself. Her duplicitous plan took a tremendous cost in lives. No few of her own agents being mutated horribly by the Varenite itself. But she successfully siphoned a vast amount of the priceless substance back to her stronghold via blood vats magically linked to her own relic cauldron, the Maith Quar. The substance's raw volatility posed a deathly threat even to Morathi, a demigoddess nearing the height of her influence. With an act of pitiless human sacrifice, 
using captives taken from her cult's battles against chaos, she was able to channel the mutative effects into the bodies of her enemies, whilst leaving the Icar's essence and power intact. These she then offered up to her nemesis Slanesh, not as a genuine gift, but as a poisoner offers a deadly chalice to her victim. The byproduct of that gift was to bear strange fruit in time, for to seek an excess of power is to empower Slanesh, no matter the method. Amidst a blood sacrifice of sickening scale, Morathi sank into the Maith Quar as an oracle and emerged in splendor as a god. Only the Aideneth, led by High King Volturnos, made a move to stop her, invading Hagnar on a roiling tide of Ether Sea. Though they interrupted Marathi's rite of apotheosis, their blow was turned aside at the last by her honeyed words. She bribed the deepkin with the promise of a city full of human souls and offered contrition by returning a relic she had stolen from them. The Okarian Lantern, the same artifact that Teclis had used to draw forth the Siathi from their abyssal purgatory within the Dark Prince's essence. So persuasive were her promises that Morathi turned her enemies into allies. They too had mutual foes and powerful hatreds that her statecraft could exploit, and before long, the blades of the Aideneth were pointed elsewhere. The first evidence of Morathi's godhood was to be seen not in Olgu, but in Akshi. There, on the Charwind coast of the Great Parch, she had long ago planted the seeds of a grand coup. Already, the Darkling Covens secretly in her employ, had increased their influence over Anvil Guard's criminal underworld to the point where they ruled over half the city. When Morathi herself took to the mist-shrouded streets, the doom of the metropolis was all but certain. The goddess brought with her the majestic host of Daughters of Cain. Such was their number that their blades glinted by the thousand in the dark. At their head came Morathi, not only in the form of a regal sorceress, but also as the titanic serpentine monstrosity known as the Shadow Queen. During the agonizing trials of her ascension, her very essence had been sundered, and now she was not one entity, but two. Whilst the Shadow Queen crushed and flattened, the artful Morathi Cain, for so she now called herself, ensorcelled and enchanted. Those Stormcast Eternals that defended the city for the most part anvils of the Heltonhammer, were not allowed to die. Should they do so, they would bring word of Marathi's perfidy to the God King upon their return to Azir. Instead, they were captured or spellbound until the great coup could be completed. In the space of a single bloody night, the city of Anvil Guard was seized, and with it, the statement of Marathi's independence made beyond a doubt. To shine amongst the darkness. 
the bane of Hish was pride. And it almost consumed the realm entirely. Were it not for the visions of Teclis, the god of light, the entire realm would have been destroyed. Yet the Lumineth and their allies came back from the brink. In doing so, they set out to save the realms from the pall of death that was consuming them. The Spirefall of Hish, known to the elves as the Okari Dara, was a time of nightmares. Tyrion masterminded a nation's wide defense, but against the resurgent demons of chaos, he was sorely pressed, and even he could not be everywhere at once. Throughout the last days of their empire, the Lumineth cried out for Teclis to help them, but to no avail. Only after a long astral journey, one in which he found common cause with the geomantic spirits of Hish's true moon, did Teclis show his people the path to salvation. Teclis gathered to his side those Lumineth who felt genuine regret at their actions and gave them a chance to put the realm's fate before their own. It took everything they had. But these seers and warrior mages became the first elementary, thereby beginning the lengthy process of establishing a symbiosis with Hish rather than ravaging it for the immense potential. Over time, the Lumineth found a new way of living. This period was known as the reinvention, and it laid the foundation for a new and hopeful elven empire. The nascent culture was still young when the Necroquake shook the realm of light to its foundations. The use of the magic crystal Aether Quartz proved vital in the realm's defense and it is a testament to the strength of the Lumineth's refocused great nations that they overcame the scourge of Shyish better than any other mortal realm. By using their newly acquired geomantic powers, Teclis and his mages burned vast elven runes of sanctity and stability into the landscape, calming its seismic convulsions and stopping it from breaking apart under the entropic influence of the Chaos Gods. Though far from undone, the work of the ruinous powers had been stalled. Now Teclis looked to more recent concern of the Arcanum Optimar. He saw Nagash's hand in the morbid curse that had fallen upon his adopted homeland, and took it upon himself to set matters right, no matter the cost. After defending Hish's human city of Settler's Gain against an invasion of Nighthaunt, he marshaled the Lumineth of Eumetrica and set out for a secret realm gate that led to the Magthar Mountains of the Prime Innerlands. There, in the eastern holdings of the Asiarch Empire, Lumineth leveled a deadly blow at Nagash's elite forces. Known as Bone Reapers to common men, these grotesque skeletal soldiers had emerged from long-hidden catacombs at the time of the Necroquake. Already, their Ossiarch empire had tithed many of Shyish's mortal populations white. 
hope had faded to a dwindling, guttering candle. And after enduring so many disasters in such quick succession, the people of Shyish had all but stopped fighting back. Teclis's plan was to wage a war of symbolic defiance. Each new act of destruction showing that the Ossiarchs could be toppled from their perches as enforcers of Nagash's dread Necrotopia. His first strike was to cast down the Triptych, three colossal statues raised in the image of the Ossiarch's empire's ruler. His second was to break the stranglehold of the pyromaniacal rulers of Crematoria. And his third was to shatter the primacy of the Staliarch lords in Equius Main. After learning firsthand that the Ossiarchs needed the bones of the dead to sustain their works, Lumineth began to incinerate their fallen, thereby starving their enemies of the one thing they craved. With a literal god fighting at their side, the Lumineth overcame the disciplined Ossiarchs on a dozen fronts. The insult did not go unnoticed. The Gash, not content with remaking the laws of magic to better suit his needs, had sent three of his Mortark lieutenants into Cayman, Iran, and Hish. They each had a mission of their own. To collapse these Shyishian realm gates, they had used for their invasions with a dread ritual, leaving black and yawning pits of unreality in their place. These would connect on a metaphysical level to the Shayesh Nadir, furthering the reach of Nagash and bleeding his baleful influence into pastures new. Each Mortark met his own challenges, the Lumineth and their allies working to refute them at every turn. It was enough to raise the ire of Nagash to such heights the god of death decided to intervene directly. In a corona of deathly energy, Nagash burst into Yemetrica, the mountainous nation from which Teclis had launched his own assault on the realm of death. Almost immediately, the landscape began to change around him. Flesh-eater ghouls called forth from the troglodytic hiding places in the Vertignius Peaks flocked to defend him as he took up the dark work that had been the Mortark Archon had been forced to abandon. No longer would Teclis and Nagash use their armies as weapons in their grand realm-crossing game of strategy. The stage was set for a clash of gods. It was atop Mount Avlinor that the rival deities met in battle. Nagash had cursed that legendary peak with powerful Shyishian magic. Already it was crumbling, and the Stoneheart King that incarnation of the mountain's ancient spirit that fought alongside the Lumineth was crumbling with it. As the mountain's sides slowed away around them, the Lumineth climbed to the peak, every meter a struggle. There, Teclis dueled Nagash on every level. From the arcane to the astral, to the physical. They were evenly matched. And when the gash struck down Selenar, the spirit of the moon, 
it looked like Teclis would falter at last. Only then did the seeds the elven god had planted so long ago bear fruit. Through a portal of light came the Sigmarite people of Settler's Gain. Their exceptionally crafted Luminarch war engines sending lances of exercising light into Nagash at the critical moment. Teclis seized his chance, binding the god of undeath with a net of white-hot magic, even as the elementor spirits of the Metrican peaks dealt their hammering blows. With a mind-shattering scream of outrage, the great necromancer was banished back to the realm of death. His physical form shattered upon the anvil of Mount Avalinor. The heart of Hish had been saved from his dark curse. Cursed Skies The demons of the ruinous power had looked with scorn, confusion, and trepidation upon Sigmar's new armies. For it seemed their new foe had some manner of immortality with which to fight them. None paid closer attention than the elder demon, Belakor, the Dark Master, and his ancient foes, the Seraphon. The Seraphon, that prehistoric Saurian race, whose very nature was to oppose chaos in all its forms, fought not only as raiders across the realms, but also in a dozen stranger theaters of war. Their invasion of a silver tower, one of the void-faring citadels of magic in thrall to Archeon, saw its spectacular destruction. The act sent a pulse of anarchic energy spilling through all the realm gates that were connected to the arcane tower. In witnessing this from his shadowy lair in Olgu, Belakor saw opportunity. For many a realm gate had been claimed by Sigmar since the storm host's first strike. First, Belakor sought an unsavory but necessary alliance with the Night Haunt, for he had been impressed by their speed and potency when facing them in defense of the Varenspire. By invading the spectral city of Dalaram with demons numerous, and arcane enough to survive its defenses, he coerced the Mortark, Lady Ollander, to become an ally rather than a foe. After all, Belakor reasoned, they had a mutual enemy in Sigmar, and a common goal, to see the lands riven with despair. Not only that, but the surging undead processions would help him mask his intent until he could accomplish his true goal. In Cayman, several towns and cities fell to Belakor's long-planned strikes. It was here, where change blows freely upon the wind, that he had planned to unleash his dread agenda. And here, where those realm's gates damaged by the Silver Tower's destruction made the cities of order most vulnerable. The Symphony of Carnage reached a crescendo in the ruined city of Prosperia, home of the famed Gate of White Gold. There, a host of demons united by Belacor's shadow-marked, hacked their way into the fortified regions of the ruins. The defenders of the city fought back fiercely, 
bolstered by Caradon traders, the detachments from Vindicarum, and hundreds of free guild soldiery. But then came Ollander's night haunt. Flowing through the city, wherever the defenders grew thin to fall upon the lines behind. The horror of the invasion became a rout. The intervention of the Sigmarite Brotherhood, a storied host of Stormcast Eternals that blazed down from Azir, held the line. And for a time, the defenders found hope anew. Ollander drank in the irony, even as her foes withered and aged into dust around her, for she had some conception of that which was to come next. With a terrific explosion, the gate of white gold vomited a colossal wave of hideous energies out into those who had sought to defend it. The stealthiest of Bellicor's agents, a team of Skaven from the clan's Ishan, had infiltrated a second god summoner's citadel and detonated a warpstone bomb within it, causing those damaged realms gates to which it was linked to go haywire. Of these, the gate at the heart of Prosperia was the largest. From the tortured portal spilled dark energy, rising and fanning out until it filled the skies. It was corruption made manifest, its innate vileness wrought by Bellicor into a terrible affliction. For here and above, a dozen shattered realm gates besides, the link between the terrestrial realm and High Azir was severed. Those storm casts that fell in the defense of Prosperia did not discorporate in blurs of ascending energy, returning to Azir to be reforged, but instead found themselves howling across bleeding skies as lightning geists. To their horror, and the wide-eyed disbelief of those still fighting, they had no means of escape. It was into this nightmarish new reality that Bellicor descended, the dark spider claiming his prey as the strings of his web grew horribly taut. The siege turned into a massacre, and the city was raised. Worse still, the Sigmarite Brotherhood were wiped out. Earlier that year, during an apocalyptic clash between the Seraphon, the Stormcast Eternals, and their mutual foes in the Legions of Chaos, Lord Celestent Gardist Steel Soul had been shocked to discover his Saurian allies abandoning the fight without explanation. Though the inscrutable slam Lord Croak remained silent and implacable when challenged, Gardist was granted potent visions, one being prescient image of Vindicarum awash with blood. It was well that he saw what he did, for the Caldera city, also in the spiral crux of Cayman, was to be the target for Bellicor's next invasion. The Dark Master intended to see the city burn, for it was the most faithful of all of Sigmar's great capitals. And its violent demise would surely seal his possession as ever chosen over that of his hated rival, Archeon. Ultimately, Gardas' vision saw the hallowed knights reinforce the beleaguered Vindicarians 
even as the demon horde breached the iron collar fortifications at the edge of the caldera city. They too paid dearly for their valor under red and bleeding skies, for the curse that Bellacor had engineered had spread across the vault of Cayman like crimson black ink spilled across a beautiful painting. As the fighting intensified, and as the city's celestial vindicator garrison showed themselves to be more interested in slaughter than defense, there were moments where Gardas feared he had consigned his fellows to a final death for no good reason. Were it not for the intervention of a sky fleet of Caradron overlords, the city would have fallen. Had not the admirals of the Geldrad voted to intervene by the slimmest of margins, Gardas and his storm host would have been slain forever. Bonds of loyalty and faith had proved potent thus far, but it was the lure of profit that saw the car-drawn armadas converge on the city to rain explosive death upon the demon horde. They took with them fire slayers intent on revenge, for the fierce worshippers of Grimnir too had suffered at the claw of the demon. Caught between the surging, wrathful Dwarden the aerial supremacy of the Caradron, and the redoubtable anvil of the Stormcast Eternals, the demons were hammered into retreat. It is whispered that Bellacor abandoned his rage-fueled onslaught upon the Caradron fleet when he found himself face to face with a white-bearded elder Dwarden whose eyes blazed with the fire of a forge. Few amongst the overlords realize that the same Dwarden was not only behind the unification of Caradron and Fireslayer, but the casting vote at the Geldrad Council that saw them make for the Vindicarium. Fewer still suspected the true identity of that ancient warrior, that of Grongni great maker, returned to unite his people at last. Era of the Beast The distant thunder of splitting chasms rolled across the Gurish heartlands as a prehistoric god awoke. Kragnos, the end of empires, had come, and with him marched endless hordes of greenskins. A war of brute force versus civilized intellect had begun, first at Excelsius, but then spilling out into the realm at large. The elven gods had fought back against the rising tide of death with all the skill they could muster. In Giran, Alariel added a new strain of life-giving magic into the music of the spheres. Its arcane power carried by her emissaries to each of the realms in turn. The beastmen, those children of chaos who fiercely opposed order in all its forms, fought tooth and nail to stop her but the Sylvaneth fought just as hard to repel them. Though it cost her dearly, the goddess's spell blossomed to full fruition. Pure life magic cascaded across the realms, the antithetical magic to the Shyishian energies of Nagash's rule. Racked by opposing forces, the lands themselves spasmed and shivered, shaking off Nagash's curse. 
and entities old and new were released upon the worlds of men in the process. Deep within the Twin Horn Peak, mightiest of all Gur's mountains, save Beastgrave itself, the prison of an elder god was finally broken. Kragnos burst from the sphere of magic in which the slam lord Croak and his long-lost dragonfolk of Gur had imprisoned him in, and smashed his way into the light with a roar of triumph. His first instinct was to head for his homeland, a continent once known as Dons, only to find his people gone, and his kingdom all but consumed by the grinding plates of Thondia. Kragnos flew into an apocalyptic rage, seeing the glimmering spires of Excelsis on the horizon as an affront to his power. He made his way north with deadly intent. Kragnos's trail of destruction saw hundreds of thousands of greenskins follow in his wake, the number of his horde growing with every victory. En route to Excelsis, he not only bound clans of Mega Gargants to his side, but clashed with the legendary Gordrak. Were it not for the intervention of the cunning Scragod of the Moon Clan, the first of Gork would have died that day. As it was, the leadership challenge and subsequent alliance saw the number of the growing Wah bolstered all the more. Excelsis, still recovering from the surreal nightmare of a Zinchian invasion and the rise of the opportunistic Skaven that followed it, was ill-prepared for a fresh disaster. The aftermath of the Chaos invasion had led to a rising cult of fanatics who saw magic as evil a fraternity whose most extreme elements abducted or murdered many practitioners of the arcane. Yet in that puritanism was another form of darkness. None suspected that the organization was a front for a Slaneshi cult that was using their agenda to abduct and sacrifice elves to a hidden demonic power. None save Galen Vendenst and his daughter Doralia, agents of the Order of Azir. Finding their way to the court of the High Banisher, a ballroom lined with the mirrors that the false Puritan had confiscated from the populace, the witch hunters slew the leaders of the cult. In doing so, they stopped the rod that was consuming Excelsis from within. They could not, however, stop the High Banisher's true masters from emerging into the city. Senessa and Dexessa, the voice of Slanesh, twin demons born from the tainted byproduct of Marathi's apotheosis some months before. With their hands forced, the demon monarchs emerged from the same room of mirrors into reality. It was all the Vendensts could do to flee for their lives, as the noble districts of Excelsis bowed to the irresistible allure of their new Slaneshi masters. Outside the city, a swift and brutal siege was taking place. With the city's Knights Excelsior defenders locked in a war against the Skaven uprising and the Slaneshi threat that had been behind it, the city walls were soon battered to dust by Kragnos and his Mega Gargants, especially 
and the Ogor mercenaries that sold their services to the city's defense turned traitor at the last moment. Excelsis's salvation came from the strangest of allies, those being Lord Croak, an ancient and mummified slan who had been instrumental in Kragnos' imprisonment, and the Shadow Queen Morathi. The newly risen goddess led her cane worshipping cult alongside the Scourge privateers, whose armada had borne her forces to battle, into a bloody war in the streets. There, her swift, agile warriors could thrive against Kragnos's Oruk followers, who, though formerly buoyed by a deadly momentum, were finding themselves scattered and broken up upon the tangle of Excelsis sprawl. The climax of the battle saw Morathi put Senessa and Dexessa to flight, even as Lord Croak opened a portal through which Kragnos willingly plunged, for he saw on the other side a fresh city of hated foes to destroy. In the aftermath, Morathi answered to the Council of Gods for her annexation of Anvilgard. But she had redeemed herself somewhat by saving Excelsis. Perhaps she would have faced exile nonetheless were it not for the mysterious Duarden, oft seen in the tumultuous events beleaguering Cayman, revealing his true identity that of Grungni, the Great Maker. The smith god of the Dwarden had returned to lend aid to Sigmar at a critical time, not least of which by forging a new breed of Stormcast Eternals whose souls were strong enough to weather the curse that Bellicor's corruption had leveled against them. Far outside Excelsis, the Oryx continued their rampages. In Kragnos, they saw an avatar of Gorkamorka, and still flocked to him from all around. Their big waz, the name given to those hordes of iron jaws, bone splitters, and cruel boys who have put aside their differences, crushed every Sigmarite strongpoint they could get their green hands on. Though few realized it, it was the cruel boys who profited the most from this new era of war. They surged from the mist-wreathed bogs in the thousands, overrunning even the most determined garrisons through their long-honed cunning. With ever-increasing confidence, they raided outpost after outpost leaving behind eerily silent buildings and the lingering stench of the deep swamps. Only gradually has the Grand Conclave of Azir come to realize that in the wake of Kragnos's rampage, a new age of war is upon them, the era of the beast. Sigmar, too, is aware of the colossal power of the greenskin races, should they unite behind a single leader. He has sent his stormcast eternals, many of their number clad in thunderstrike armor of Grungni's invention, to meet the Oryx in battle and slay every warlord they can before the tribes reach critical mass. In truth, it may already be too late.